At the heart of information age communications is the pure, powerful light of the laser, a device invented at AT&T Bell Laboratories. The breakthrough paper describing the laser was published in 1958 by co-inventors Arthur Shallow and Charles Townes. The invention of the laser, which harnessed excited molecules and atoms to amplify light itself, was a scientific leap forward, yet its roots were in research started long before. During World War II, I was at Bell Telephone Laboratories working on microwaves and radar, and I recognized from that work that molecules interact with microwaves, they absorb microwaves, and that could form a basis for studying molecules, and so after the war, at Bell Laboratories, I started doing what's known as microwave spectroscopy. That is the study of the interaction of these waves with molecules. Spectroscopy in that region was essentially unknown at that time. And it, I thought that it offered the possibility of making extremely precise measurements, finding out much more detail about molecules and about atoms and nuclei than had been done before. Towns found that the shorter the wavelength he worked with, the more interesting the interactions became. To produce very strong microwaves, he developed, while at Columbia University in the early 50s, a microwave amplifier called the MASER, which stands for Microwave Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. Excited molecules in a resonator box were stimulated to give up their excess energy in interactions with passing waves, amplifying the microwaves in the process. Also at Columbia University was the young researcher Arthur Shallow. In 1949, then I got a fellowship to go to Columbia University to work on microwave spectroscopy with Charles Townes, which was the beginning of a very fruitful association. Uh, he was a wonderful person to work with. He was a leader in the field and full of ideas. The two worked together on numerous projects and continued to collaborate after Shallow went to work with Bell Labs, where Towns was a consultant. Both were intrigued with the idea of exploring waves along the electromagnetic spectrum in regions where wavelengths were shorter and frequencies greater than those of microwaves. These could be found in the optical or visible light regions of the spectrum. It was a classic problem to uh, find ways to uh, go from longer to shorter wave, generate shorter and shorter wavelengths. And it had always been found very useful as we went from broadcast band all the way down to microwaves. Different uses for each kind of waves, but they're all electromagnetic waves like radio waves. And if we could go farther, there would be some uses for them. They believe that the same principle behind microwave stimulation could be applied to light waves and began to formulate a theory for an optical maser, or as it would be called, the laser. In the case of a maser, microwaves, we had waves in a cavity that bounced back and forth and picked up energy from molecules. Now light waves could do the same thing. That is, if the atom is up here in this excited energy level, has excess energy, the light can come along and tickle it or stimulate it to fall down to the lower state, giving its energy to the wave. And that stimulated emission of radiation. But in bouncing back and forth in the cavity, the light waves could go in any direction and come out just as a kind of a jumble. While it would be interesting, it wouldn't be nearly as valuable as having a simple, pure light coming out in one direction like a wave. To make the light directional, Shallow and Towns proposed that excited atoms or molecules be put in a narrow transparent tube, capped at either end by a mirror. Excited atoms could emit spontaneously in any direction. But waves not traveling along the tube's axis would go through the walls and be lost. Emissions along the axis would build up by reflecting back and forth between the mirrors, stimulating atoms to release their stored excess energy, which would amplify the wave as it passed. That energy is fed into the wave at exactly the same frequency and exactly the same direction. So the wave is not disturbed at all or modified, it's simply increased in intensity. Once amplified through this process, some of the waves leak through the partial mirror as a beam of laser light, which, unlike ordinary light, has a pure frequency and is coherent. Arthur Shallow explains. 
the waves are in step. That is, if it's a crest at this part of the wave, it's a crest here. If it's a trough here, it's a trough here. And that's because the atoms, instead of radiating independently, are forced or stimulated to emit by the wave that's stored between the two mirrors of the laser resonator. Well, that makes light in a, an extremely pure form, something we've just never had before. Shallow and Towns' paper stimulated intensive research by others at Bell Labs and by scientists at universities and companies around the world. In 1960, Shallow and Towns received a patent through Bell Labs for the laser. That same year, Theodore Maiman of Hughes Aircraft Company built the first working laser using an intense flash of light to energize a synthetic ruby rod. In 1961, Bell Lab scientists Ali Javan, William Bennett, and Donald Harriot produced a continuously operating beam. Using a mixture of helium and neon gases stimulated by a radio frequency generator, this laser was an important step toward utilizing the device for communications. Development progressed rapidly in the 1960s. New lasers of different solids and gases were tested including the high-power carbon dioxide laser invented at Bell Labs by Kumar Patel, and the first of what would be an avalanche of applications were realized. One of the very first applications was for, within a couple of years of the first laser, was for surgery on the retina of the eye. And the surgical applications are, have now spread to all parts of the body, and the doctors find that they have less bleeding and less trauma than other methods of surgery when they're applicable. The light's precision and controlled intensity are also applied to industrial processing, where laser tools are commonplace for cutting extremely hard metals and soft materials, such as cloth, for drilling and welding, for surveying and measurements, for printing, and for precision work on complex circuit boards. Closer to home, lasers are used to scan price information in high-speed barcode systems. Compact audio discs use lasers to read encoded digital information, which is then converted to music. And some applications merge the practical with the artistic. Holograms, three-dimensional pictures created by reflected laser beams, can produce beautiful and stunning images. But they're also used for design testing to illustrate stress points and improve design efficiency. In 1970, Bell Lab scientist Mort Panish created the first room temperature semiconductor laser that emitted a continuous light beam. Its tiny size enabled it to be mounted on an optical transmitter, helping to make light wave communications practical. Seven years later, AT&T installed a trial light wave system in Chicago. Today, there's a multi-billion dollar communications industry using lasers to send signals around the globe. Information is encoded as pulses of light and sent through glass fiber light guides. Along the way, the light pulses are detected and converted to electronic signals that are amplified and used with another laser, which sends the voice, data, and video signals to their destination. Light wave systems are more reliable, efficient, faster and take less space than all electronic systems. Laser and fiber development is progressing rapidly, enabling error-free signals to be transmitted over distances greater than 100 miles without reamplification. A photonic amplifier has been devised for possible use in light wave systems. Currently, the small bundles of light called photons, which comprise the light wave signal, must be converted to electrons for amplification, then converted back to photons to continue their journey. The photonic amplifier boosts the signal by about 100 times, and a single amplifier can strengthen signals of many different frequencies. Already, society's use of the laser is taken for granted, even as its impact continues to widen. In the last half of the 20th century, the laser has changed the way humans work, play, treat illness, manufacture and buy goods, and communicate. And the future holds the promise of new and surprising applications in science research, in energy, where hydrogen atoms fused by lasers might produce fusion power, in high-speed optical computing, 
and further advances in telecommunications. The laser is proving itself a bright guide for the future of the information age. I frequently get asked, uh, how far are we along in exploiting a laser? How much further has it to go and so on? I would put the laser at about, let's say, uh, a teenage kind of state. That one can see its potentialities, it can do quite a lot, it certainly is not mature, and we don't know exactly where it's going, but we can roughly see where it's going, and it has still a very long way to go. There are many, many different kinds of lasers and, and many different totally unrelated applications. And uh, I really think that we are just limited to what we can do in the future by what we can imagine, as well as what we can engineer after we imagine it. But I think it's the imagination needs to run beyond what we can do.